All right, so as I said in my last video, I'm going to spend a few videos looking at how we explain things that are happening in physics. And in this scenario, what we're going to look at is a the physics of taking a pretty spectacular free kick. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you that free kick. I imagine most of you watching it uh, are way too young to have actually seen this. This is uh, Roberto Carlos, who was a Brazilian footballer a long, long time ago. Firstly, note the stupidly long run-up that he has for taking free kicks, which anyone sort of my age and around that who are playing football at the time then immediately started copying. Um, but more importantly, we're going to look at the bend that he's able to put on the ball, and more importantly, why he is able to put that in bend on the ball. So let's take a look at the actual free kick, and then we'll dig into the physics behind it. Okay, so here we go. Here's the stupidly long run-up, and the keeper looks like a Muppet. So if we watch that again in a bit slower... So you can see the ball bends outside the post and then curves back in. So you can see to start with it's going to the right and then it bends back to the left. So that's what we're going to be trying to explain in this video. Okay, so we've seen what is a fairly spectacular free kick. There's lots of other ones I could have picked. I could have also taken a look at like top spin in tennis. There's you know there's there's loads of different variations of the same thing. Um, so first, let's start off with how biology would explain that. Um, and the short answer is, they wouldn't. And what they would do is they would say this. The reason the ball did that is because of the Magnus effect. Great. Uh, so what's happened there is they've used some terminology that you're not familiar with um, and essentially said, this, uh, this is why that's happened. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks, biology. Um, but what we want to know is why did that happen? How can we put it in simpler terms that will leave you actually understanding what happened there? Or at least attempt to do that. So let's get into, first of all, the principles that I use whenever I'm trying to explain something. And then we'll get into the specific laws that are relevant to this scenario. Okay, so let's take a look at the general concepts I use when I'm trying to explain something, and then I'll look at how these apply to this specific context. So some general ideas that I use when I'm trying to explain things in physics. The first one is often unsaid, but I think is really important, is that if nothing is changing, then no explanation is required. And actually, you can't explain um, that. That's just something you have to accept. So if you have an object that's spinning and someone asks you, why does that object keep spinning? You can't really give them an answer to that question. That's just something that we've observed everywhere in the universe, that things will keep doing what they're doing unless you do something to change them. So this is quite a hard idea to get used to because we're used to there being an explanation for things or even multiple explanations of things but this is something that you just have to accept because it's something that we have seen consistently throughout the universe. The second thing I would do is if we've got a situation where something is changing and therefore requires explaining I would start by articulating what change is occurring so is the velocity of an object changing or the, the shape or something along those lines articulating what change is occurring is really helpful for then considering why that change is occurring so then the third thing that i think about when i'm trying to explain something is once i've articulated what change is happening you can then bring in your various laws of physics which have been established through repeated experiments to explain why that change occurred and that's the kind of the flip side so we said if no change is occurring we don't need an explanation if a change is occurring we do and must have an explanation okay so that, that's kind of the two sides of that coin okay so let's get back to our specific okay so let's have a look at the newton's laws that are relevant to the scenario we're looking at so these are Newton's three laws of motion. Um, allegedly, the, at least the first two were published by Robert Hooke before Newton, and there was a whole feud between them. Um, but I'm not going to get into that here 
we all call them Newton's laws, so I'm going to stick to that. With any laws, the first thing to always think about is, do these laws apply here? So, for example, Newton's laws do not work at the subatomic particle level, like when you're looking at electrons and protons. So I wouldn't use them for that. But we have shown that they consistently work on our sort of level scale. So like of everyday objects, things on Earth, stuff like that. And so they've been on that level. These laws have been accepted to be true. And we can then use them to explain changes that occur. So let's articulate what these three laws are. These might look slightly different to how you've seen them before. I've, I've modified them to fit this scenario specifically, um, but they're just a, basically a rewording of what they actually are. So Newton's first law, an object will remain at constant velocity, which means its direction will stay the same and its speed will stay the same unless it's acted on by a resultant or unbalanced force. So this is basically re-articulating what I was saying earlier, that if something is changing, that needs an explanation. And in this scenario, the explanation is a force. Or on the flip side, if something's velocity is constant, nothing is changing, so that doesn't require an explanation. So there's no force acting on it. Newton's second law, this is probably the most modified compared to what you might have seen. So the rate of change of an object's velocity, also known as acceleration, is proportional to the resultant force acting on the object. And the second part of this, which is often unsaid, but I think is really important, is that the change in velocity is in the same direction as the resultant force. And we'll see with this example what that looks like. Um, but that's not usually said, but I think is a really important idea to have. And the third law, the, probably the most misunderstood or confused one, um, the, I think the simplest way to articulate it is that if object A exerts a force on object B, object B exerts an equal magnitude force on object A, but in the opposite direction. So those are the, the three laws we're going to be using to explain what's going on with that free kick. So let's get straight into it. So just to set the context here, this diagram, we're looking at a bird's eye view. So we're looking down on the free kick. So we saw it take this kind of path here, right? So we saw the ball go outside the post and then bend back in and make the goalkeeper look like a complete idiot when it went in the net and he hadn't really moved. So essentially, the whole time the ball is going towards the goal, but that's not particularly important because that component of its velocity isn't changing and so we don't have to do any explaining with that part. Actually its velocity in that direction is slowly reducing over time due to drag but that's not really the effect we're interested in here so I'm going to skip over that. The interesting part for this scenario is why the object initially goes to the right and then ends up going to the left. That's a clear change that's occurring and therefore that needs an explanation. So in terms of looking at that, so the ball was initially going to the right because we can see that because it's coming outside the post and then it bends back. So it's at the end, it's going to the left. So what that means is that there's been a change in velocity and the change in velocity will be to the left because it's gone from going to the right and is now going to the left. So the change goes from start to finish. And Newton's second law tells us that if there's been a change in velocity to the left, there must have been a resultant force to the left that has caused it. So if we break that down, remember I said what we do is we state what we observe and then we use a law of physics to explain what we've observed. So the observation is that the ball was initially going to the right and then it ended up going to the left. So since its velocity has changed, that's our observation, Newton's first law tells us it must have experienced a force. That's our explanation for what's happened. And in adding in more detail using Newton's second law, since the change in velocity is to the left, Newton's second law tells us a force must have acted to the left. So that's again our explanation as to why the change was to the left, it's because the force was to the left. Now, this is quite unsatisfactory, at least it is for me, because that's all very well and good, but then my brain goes, well, why? 
Why does it experience a force to the left? What's causing it? Well, it's not gravity. Gravity is acting downwards, right? So that can't have made it change its velocity to the left. Like drag acts in the opposite direction to an object's velocity. So that's not going to cause it. Like, why is this happening? And this is where the Magnus effect comes in, right? So what we to actually explain why it experiences a force to the left, we actually need to look at what happens to an air particle around a spinning object. So let's take a look. So essentially, what we can see here is initially here, before it starts spinning, air doesn't change direction when it comes past the object. It just goes in a straight line. Yes, it's deflected a little bit around it, but the air goes in a straight line. Once the objects are spinning, you can see the air gets deflected sort of upwards in this scenario. So it's, but that object is spinning clockwise and the air is deflected upwards here. And this makes the object experience a force, in this case, downwards. Okay. So that's essentially what we're going to use. So we're going to again use Newton's laws and we're going to think about the motion of the air particles and use that to explain why the spinning object experiences a force. So here we go. So again, we're in our bird's eye view. And in this scenario, the ball is spinning in an anti-clockwise direction if we're looking down on it. Right, that's the spin that the player puts on the ball when they kick it. And that's the, essentially the cause of everything. So if an, if an object is spinning in this anti-clockwise direction, but it's going sort of upwards on this slide, right? Because we're looking down on it and it's heading towards the goal. This is the path an air particle ends up taking due to that spin. So the air particle is coming down this way, it gets deflected around the ball and it ends up going in this direction here, right? So most of the time we consider air particles to be essentially stationary, right? They're jiggling about a lot, but they're not on net moving anywhere. But after its interaction with the ball, this air particle is now moving somewhere. It now has velocity in this direction here. So it's experienced a change in velocity in this direction, though therefore, according to Newton's second law, it must have experienced a force in that same direction. Because there's been a change, there must have been a force that caused that change. Okay, so that's the first part here. So it's experienced a change in velocity to the right and backwards, right? Because remember, forwards is like towards the goal, so backwards is kind of down on this slide. And so it's experienced a change in velocity to the right and backwards. So therefore it must have experienced a force to the right and backwards. That is the air particles. Now Newton's third law tells us that if the air particle experiences a force backwards and right from the ball, the ball must experience a force forward and to the left of the same magnitude from each air particle. And this is actually the source of the force on the ball. So the, the fact that it has an effect on the air particles means the air particles have an effect on the ball. And this is the force that makes it change its velocity from being to the right to the left. And that's essentially how you end up making the goalkeeper look so stupid. So hopefully you, even if you didn't follow all of that, you now have a little bit of a better understanding of the physics that went into what is a fairly spectacular free kick. And maybe I've shared something with you that you've not seen before, even if it's just you going and trying out a ridiculously long free kick run up in the future. So that it brings us to the end of this video. I'm going to continue this video series looking at how we explain things in physics and we're going to be using those same ideas that we use in this video. If things aren't changing we don't need an explanation. If things are changing we articulate what has changed and then we use a law of physics to explain why that has changed. And that's the same process that I use time and time and time again whenever you're explaining something in physics.